Good afternoon. Welcome to the Macquarie University Liberal Club Sunday Sessions podcast. Live from the Facebook main page, my name is Andrew Kremen and I'm joined by my co-host Rory O'Connor. Hey, how's it going? I'm pretty good, man. I'm pretty good. Our topic today, vaccine passports. Despite assurances of them not being adopted in Australia, it now appears that we are going to be seeing them, at least in this state of New South Wales. Joining us to talk about this is Dr. Rocco Loyacono, contributor at The Spectator and law lecturer at Curtin University. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to have you on. Um, now, remember, you can ask your questions in the comments section, and we'll try and get as many of them uh, to Dr. Rocco as, um, as best we can. Um, firstly, um, can you give us a brief overview um, about, this, about the current situation regarding vaccine passports? Okay. Now, obviously, there are a few uh, disclaimers that we have to put in from the start. None of what I say today is legal advice. People are free to go and get their own legal advice, but I'm not qualified to give legal advice. Um, so anything I say today should not be interpreted uh, in that regard. And I'm not going to focus on the pharmacological aspects of the vaccines. Obviously, um, I'm not qualified for that. Safe to say that at the moment, the evidence we're seeing is that they're for personal protection only because um, not, they don't stop transmission. Their effectiveness is, is waning over time. And if anyone has any uh, interest in what I've written on this subject in the past, um, you're more than welcome to go and look at uh, articles I've written in The Spectator on that, but we're not going to touch on that uh, today, which leads me into the general discussion about uh, vaccine passports. Now, look, the argument that was used, I did an interview on local radio here um, a little while ago, and people say, oh, but look, you know, we need a yellow fever vaccine to go to, I don't know, Indonesia or Africa or whatever it is. But in my view, comparing that kind of issue with a papers please society where you need uh, to prove a medical procedure has been done to go to access basic services, uh, to me is like comparing apples with watermelons, if you like, it's not even apples with oranges. And the issue here is around informed consent. Okay, now informed consent to any medical procedure is has long been enshrined in the common law. And it's also been encapsulated in international agreements. The most off-quoted international agreement is the Nuremberg Code of 1947. And a quote from that, which says that the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. Now, uh, that was born uh, for those of those for those of you who know who know your history out of the Nuremberg trials uh, following the Second World War, where some really horrific stories of what the Nazis and other totalitarian dictators, uh, by the way, were doing um, to prisoners. Uh, now that has actually been encapsulated in Australia in the uh, Australian Immunisation Handbook, which makes it quite clear uh, that uh, vaccines would be given uh, in a totally voluntary manner and free from any coercion uh, or otherwise. Um, which leads me to ask the question uh, whether uh, the idea of, or the concept of vaccine passports uh, infringes uh, the, the concept of informed consent. And I, my view is, is that it does uh, for, for several reasons. Um, Obviously, obviously, from the from the coercion point of view, I mean the idea that you can't go and to eat, or you can't go and do a basic uh, thing that you would normally do in your everyday life. Uh, you can't go and visit somebody. You can't go over here uh, unless you have this medical procedure done. Uh, to me, is a form of coercion, and it also, uh, particularly those who are facing uh, mandates at, at work. It also this coercion includes, and I'm just going to bring up something that I have seen the other day on it. Um, yeah, um, the whole idea about uh, absence of undue pressure, coercion or manipulation. Now, if someone says to you, you won't have this job or you're going to lose job opportunities or you're suffering bullying, as is happening in a lot of places right now, one now needs to look at what's going on in the WA police force at the moment. Um, as a result of not getting the vaccine, obviously, I mean, in my view, I, I would say that would uh, amount to unconscionable or undue pressure, i.e. economic and emotional duress. 
So I don't see how anyone can give informed consent uh, in those circumstances. The other thing we need to, but there are two other things I'll touch on and then I'll uh, hand over, uh, we might get stuck into some questions, is people often ask me about the Constitution. Uh, they cite in particular a section 5123A, which prohibits any form of civil conscription on the basis uh, of uh, medical procedures. Now, um, no, uh, and the section, just paraphrasing, it says, this section indicates that no medical treatment shall be imposed on anyone without uh, his, or inform his or her informed consent, um, because it would be uh, to impose a form of civil prescription. Now, there we have the difficulty in between the interplay of the constitution and uh, the states with federation. Obviously, we live in a federation. Now, the, there's the constitution sitting on top, but obviously, as we know, in our federation, the states have the responsibility for the hospitals, for the health system. So these pu public health orders that are being made in relation to you know, mask wearing and social distancing and uh, vaccine mandates and all this other, all these other things are being made under state public health acts. The issue then becomes what is the interplay between the, pu the state public health acts, the Commonwealth Constitution, and also the Biosecurity Act, which again sits on top of all of those. Now, an argument was made uh, very early on uh, when the borders were closed um, that the Commonwealth could actually override uh, the state border closures because uh, under the uh, Constitution, uh, and in particular under the Biosecurity Act, could actually, under the quarantine power, could actually declare the whole of Australia a quarantine zone. Therefore, um, there would be uh, any, any state that wished to impose a border, a closed border, uh, they wouldn't be able to do it because the Commonwealth is overarchingly exercising its, its quarantine power. The other issue that comes up uh, also in relation to this is the free movement of citizens, um, which again is an enshrined common law right and uh, also uh, was seen in the High Court in Leith and the Commonwealth, a 1992 case where Justice Dean and Tui argued that the principle of equality, I'm just quoting from the judgment, is embedded impliedly in the constitution. They stated the essential or underlying theoretical equality of all persons under the law and before the courts is and has been a fundamental and generally beneficial doctrine of the common law and a basic precept, prescript, I should say, of the administration of justice under our system. So one could argue that in a free society, governed in accordance with the principles of representative parliamentary democracy, this entails freedom of movement, association and freedom of speech. So all these things, I think, uh, make vaccine passports problematic and then leaving to one side all the pharmacological issues. I think uh, legally there are definitely uh, some issues here. More than that, I really can't expand because also these are also the subject of cases before the courts. In particular, there's an action in the New South Wales Supreme Court at the moment, and I know there'll be more. And I think also these definitely also the subject of cases in America, particularly challenging vaccine mandates. Again, comparing the American legal system to the Australian legal system is not comparing like for like. But the fact is that the other day, as a Joe Biden came out and wanted to enforce a vaccine mandate for all companies or businesses who employ over 100 people, and immediately uh, 20 states said, bring it on, pal. <laughs> um, <laughs> see you in court, basically. Obviously, that's probably not going to happen here. But again, it, it just... It's problematic. We're also seeing it in terms of uh, restaurants in New York. Uh, the a series, of, a group of restaurateurs got together and have challenged the New York restaurant vaccine mandate. Again, it's America, etc. But some of the principles about freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of speech, Australia, the Australian High Court has drawn on some of the American jurisprudence on that. So without wishing to say one way or the other which way it's going to go, because we're in a new world here with a and I don't, and I mean that in the proper sense of the expression, we're going to see a lot more of this and a lot of it is about possibilities and what's going to happen. Again, that depends a lot on some of the, some of the judicial argument that we're going to see over the next weeks and months. And if anyone needs to be reminded about who believes in informed consent, um, one only needs to look at the Prime Minister's press conference and the transcript of his press conference on the 22nd of July. And you can find that on his website. Uh, you can download the transcript. And he said he believes in informed consent and that he's responsible for what he puts into his body, just like everyone is responsible for what they put into their bodies. And that's the kind of country we live in. So obviously we have someone here who's just like, uh, what is it? 
what does Paul Murray call a gold standard Gladys? One day she says, we're not going to have any more lockdowns. And lo and behold, you're in a lockdown. Uh, back in July, she was uh, June, she was saying, we're not going to have vaccine passports. And lo and behold, you've got vaccine passports. So look, these people, their word isn't worth the pay. <laughs> isn't worth the paper it's written on sometimes. I'll hand it over to, to you if you've, and we can deal with maybe some more substantive issues. Thank you very much for that. I think I'm, I'm going to have to rewatch all of that and find those specific, um, mm. like, well, actually, if I can ask you about um, mm. the current cases be, um, before the court. Yes. In Australia, the ones that could define what is legal and is not legal, especially mm. under the constitution. Could you go more, uh, deeper into those, please? Okay, look, without um, obviously going into chapter and verse, they do uh, bear on the legality of the public health orders and what they're allowed to prescribe. Again, bringing in section 5123 of the constitution, because obviously under the constitution, if there's a state law that's inconsistent with a Commonwealth law, the Commonwealth law will prevail. And it, yeah, obviously that these vaccine mandates in particular, because we're talking about vaccine mandates at the moment, not vaccine passports, mandating for a particular job, like construction workers, teachers, emergency services, et cetera, and, and uh, whether under the, again, the interplay between those and, again, the, the Commonwealth Biosecurity Act, um, whether they're, whether the states under the public health orders actually have the power to make these orders. And that, I think, sums it up in sufficient detail for, for your viewers. The, the freedom of movement and impinging personal liberty, the right, again, of informed consent, as uh, indicated not only in the Nuremberg Code, but as we see in the Australian Immunisation Handbook, they, they come to the, they, they're, they're critical, I think, in understanding um, the reason the reason for this litigation. So depending on the outcome of some of these court cases, could we see a scenario where perhaps uh, fines people have been issued that they uh, they no longer have to pay those? Would that be a scenario or? I think it stands to reason if an orders under which a fine is issued is declared invalid, then obviously the fine falls away. The other thing I think we also need to bear in mind here some people might call me a cynic, I prefer to call myself a realist, is these cases, I think now we'll, we will now see, uh, it will be a good test of the independence of the judiciary, um, just how independent they are or whether they serve the masters. Because don't forget in Australia, unlike in America, judges are appointed by the government of the day. So how far they're prepared to go to uh, invalidate laws of the government of the day is going to be interesting. That wasn't so much an issue in the Section 92 case that Clive Palmer brought, and I know I'm digressing here, but the issue with that particular case, I think, again, there were ways in which they were argued, because it relied very much on Section 92 of the Constitution, in that the freedom of freedom intercourse between the states shall be absolutely free, when I think in the past there had been decisions where the court, had, the High Court actually said, well, look, that's not actually to be interpret, interpreted Literally, you need to have what is reasonable and proportionate in the, that, and appropriately adapted in, in those circumstances. And I think that also might be another theme we might see here, is it reasonably appropriate and proportionate in the circumstances that the orders that are being imposed uh, need to be imposed. And of course, those arguing against will say, no, look, it's not reasonable and it's not proportionate. That's another issue I think we need to bear in mind. So it's kind of like the, um, the free speech argument in the United States that if someone is you know, advocating, say, for violent speech, that may not be covered as free speech. And that mm. there's a similar sort of thing here where you're saying it's proportional. Mm. And so potentially in the case of a public, um, uh, public health emergency, we may not be able to, uh, to cross a border. Is that, is, mm. that, is that an embarrassing? Yes, because at the moment, basic, uh, all the states are in a state of emergency. The issue with a state of emergency, governments would love governments love them because, hey, look what they've done. They've suspended parliament. Uh, they've suspended civil liberties. That's the thing with the imposition on New South Wales and now Victoria that the Premier over here has imposed, that even if you're a resident of this state, if you want to get back in, uh, you need to have show evidence that you've at least had one shot of the, of the COVID vaccine. Well, I mean, that's a vaccine passport, but again, passed without any public parliamentary scrutiny or anything like that, which would have been done in the ordinary course of events because, hey, there's a state of emergency and we've got carte blanche to do whatever we want. So, again, um, that's, that's another live issue, whether uh, as under a state of emergency that it would be reasonably appropriate and adapted, proportionate and all those kind of things. I and, again, I mean, if people are getting frustrated that I'm not coming down one side mm -hmm. or the other, I really can't because, you know, again, yeah. these are live issues. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I just had an audience question come in here and sure. it says... 
Boris Johnson has decided to scrap um, vaccine passports in winter after a backlash from his party backbench. Mm. Uh, can that still be a possible or a possibility with the state and the federal governments here? The thing about the UK, and that's one of the beauties, I think, of the UK system where the backbenchers really stand up. Uh, they do represent their own views. Now, it's not obviously not going to happen in the Labor Party because the Labor Party doesn't allow conscience votes unless it's an issue like abortion or euthanasia, those kind of things. The Liberal Party, obviously, up until fairly recently, uh, had a, a, a proud tradition of backbenchers uh, voting with their conscience and crossing the floor. Now, you've seen a couple of examples. I mean, Tanya Davies in New South Wales, what she produced the private members bill, Craig Kelly in the federal parliament. But of course, the issue with the private members bill is, guess who decides what legislation brought on is, is and isn't brought on? It's the leader of the government. So when people were rejoicing that Craig Kelly brought in his uh, no vaccine passports bill, the fact is he really can't do much with it because the prime minister decides what legislation goes before it. But to get back to the issue of your question, Look, more parliamentarians, yeah, definitely, and particularly, I think, on the conservative side, you need to, uh, and look, I think I can say this quite safely, we're in the, what is it, this is Macquarie University Liberal Club, I think I can say that more conservative parliamentarians and more people on the conservative side need to get a bit of, bit of a spine and start opposing this kind of tyranny, um, just like Boris Johnson faced. Now, the thing about Boris Johnson is they were able to use his own words against him because he said not all that long ago he didn't want a papers please society and I think you can go back quite some years and look at what Boris Johnson said and wrote when he was the editor of the spectator and now he's turned 180 degrees the reasons for that we can all speculate on but yeah from what I've seen there privately there are, or from what I've heard I should say there are privately parliamentarians who would oppose this but when it gets to actually I mean look what um, pretty much what is it Morrison forced Kelly out of the party room so, uh, and look, obviously the Prime Minister, I mean, he has a certain degree of power, which after the 2019 election, it's a bit like when Keating won the 93 election, I think. He, he won an election people didn't expect him to win, so it gave him a sense of power in the party that he might not have otherwise have had. But, yeah, look, that is, that is one way to, to stop this if more, uh, if more parliamentarians uh, listen to their constituents and say that they don't want this. And look at what's happened in, um, in places like uh, Denmark. They've now removed them. Yeah, it is a possibility. Um, again, it depends on the political will of the people at the time, because don't forget, even, uh, what is it, Milton Friedman said, there's, uh, there's no such thing as, uh, no, nothing is so permanent as a temporary government measure. Um, so when politicians say these things are temporary, I wouldn't trust that at all. So it, it's up to us to tell the parliamentarians that we don't like this and we, we oppose it and for them to actually uh, relay that and then act on it. Well, I, I feel like this is why this is one of the central reasons why they were voted in to begin with. It's not enough to privately dis to disagree with it. You've, you've That's really right. got, it's one of the sole reasons why they're there. Yeah. Um, so no, you're, you're definitely with, uh, with like minds here. Um, yeah. And I mean, and when you, when you, and look, I'm sure people and people like I, myself, I hear stories and sorry to cut across you, Andrew. Oh, I wrote to my local MP. I wrote to the Senator. I didn't get a response. Yeah, well, this is, this is the thing. This is, this is uh, something that's been faced time and time again. And if they're there to represent us, but they can't be bothered to respond to correspondence, even, even with the pro forma, thanks very much, I've received your email or received your letter. Well, like you say, Andrew, what are they there for? Well, if I, if I can bring up um, uh, Mark Latham, um, him, yeah. uh, Mark Latham, George Christensen and others, uh, they've mentioned a form called Ceasing Correspondence and Release of Information. Um, mm. It stops third parties from accessing your vaccination records, including your own doctor. By yeah. signing up, will the average person be locked out of a business anyway, as in because they did not disclose, then whether they're vaccinated or not, they will be treated mm. As unvaccinated. I haven't seen, I've just read superficially some things on that. And again, the possibility that you raise, uh, that's one of the possibilities that's been raised in the material that I've read, again, not in any great detail. And so look, I'll take that question on notice. But having said that, Mark Latham is one of the few politicians in this country still making sense. 
which is a far cry from my impression anyway of him in the 2004 election when I thought he was stark raving mad. <laughs> um, but look, it's something that I think uh, strategically, from a strate- it's something you might want to do from a definitely think or consider, I should say, from a strategic point of view. But whether the effect of that is that a business will conclude, oh, you're only doing this because you're not vaccinated and you don't want to tell me. Yeah, again, that's an open possibility. But the interplay, then there's another interplay with that with discrimination laws, because obviously businesses can't lock you out on the basis of certain uh, provisions of discrimination laws. And again, I think that's another issue, whether you'd be unfairly discriminated against. And that was an issue that came up in the New York teachers case, which on Friday, uh, the court, Supreme Court New York handed down a decision. Uh, New York teachers cannot be stood down on unpaid leave if they're not vaccinated. They still have to be offered uh, a paid position uh, based on recognised medical or religi- religious exemption. Uh, in America, the van, all the mandates I've seen in America, they have the carve out for the religious exemption. So, yeah, it would be the, as I say, the issue between that and and the discrimination laws might might come into play. Another audience question here says, will the issue of vaccine passports create a push for a Bill of Rights in Australia? Look, it might. Um, the issue with the, I have with the Bill of Rights is people look up to the American Bill of Rights and see it as uh, a path to be followed um, and or, a, or some kind of charter of rights and freedoms. Uh, to that, I'll say two things. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has... Uh, which was enacted, I think, under the father of the present Canadian Prime Minister, uh, Pierre Trudeau, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, has led to the courts uh, interpreting provisions and allowing all kinds of woke effects. And see, the thing is, when you put something down on paper, it becomes justiciable. It means the courts get a go at it. Whereas at the moment, if you look at the UK constitution, it's an un, what they call an unwritten constitution, but it's a, it's a blend of written laws in some particular statutes, but also convention, tradition, what's been handed down over time. And that's why I think uh, the UK system has, has worked so well. And it's also probably why the founding fathers of our constitution didn't want to go so far as to, as to enact a Bill of Rights. The other, I'll also mention the Victorian Uh, Victoria has a a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I think, and look how well that's worked over the last 18 months. I mean, seriously. So, look, pushes for Bill of Rights or for Bills of Rights, I should say, as um, well-intentioned, well-meaning as they are, I don't think, I don't think they're going to solve the problem. The American Bill of Rights, as I said, is very much a, a Bill of Rights par excellence, but I don't think in Australia it's going to achieve what people would hope it it, it would achieve. Um, And as I say, you only have to look to what's happened in Canada and to look at what's happened in Victoria to see, A, the perverse effects of a chart of rights and freedoms and, two, how ineffectual it can be in circumstances like this. So sorry to disappoint you on that one. That's that's all right. Um, We've got another question. Uh, What is the legal liability on businesses for not enforcing uh, vaccine passports? That is to be seen um, because I'm not sure what the public health orders are going to say about that. Look, I know in France, the the police definitely have been imposing tens of thousands of euro fines on businesses that aren't enforcing it. But again, have the police got the resources to go into every restaurant, every retail outlet, every business and check? Uh, For those of who are members of the IPA, Gideon Rosner sends out a missive every week. And he says this, look, state coercion in the form of domestic vaccine passport should be rejected, rejected if for no other reason than the horrifying precedent and sense, precedent it sets. Then again, my instinct is that vaccine passports will go the COVID safe app. Remember that? How that was gonna be the big ticket and how it was fail safe and da da da. The QR code check-ins, how often have they been policed? Right? Um, poorly, poorly constructed, hard to enforce, widely ignored, and eventually defunct. I mean, that's my hope. But yeah, look, the, the resources that are going to be required to enforce this 
are going to be huge. And I and what what as I think I was talking to you, Andrew, earlier today um, about what's happening in France. The the crime rate in Paris uh, has gone through the roof because the police are too busy or too occupied checking whether a business is complying with with a with a vaccine passport uh, or a, what they call them their health passes um, rather than actually catching the crooks. This is the this is where the common sense come in, comes in. Are we going to waste time and resources checking on this over something at the end of the day, which 99.7% of people who have it have mild or are mild or asymptomatic once we've already protected the vulnerable, or are we actually going to use police resources for what it's there for, and that is trying to prevent crime? Again, these are all things that remain to be seen. Right. And it's also, an, I, I don't know why businesses are racing to, to do it. Uh, it. It's an impost on them. Um, I mean, the whole QR code thing that over here, the, you know, the mandatory contact register and all of that, it's one thing to have the law, whether how often it's applied or enforced is another thing. And I mean, I can't comment state by state how these QR codes and mandatory contact registers have been enforced, but uh, you guys over there might be more in a position to to tell me. But surely the compliance hasn't been one hundred anywhere near one hundred percent. I would have thought there's definitely uh, a gap, a big gap there. I found this strong compliance. Okay, I, okay. I definitely found that. Okay, maybe maybe New South because in New South Wales you set them up. I mean, I'm, from WA perspective, because you know, we're in a prison island here where it's all been locked out. You know. <laughs> People, uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't think the. I don't think, and without obviously seeing the figures, the compliance rate has been anywhere near as high as maybe you suggest in New South Wales. But then again, in New South Wales, you set them up pretty early on in the piece, um, so it's something people got used to, I suppose. And but what about the enforcement of that, though? If I can ask a question, how? Uh, what's the? What are the resources that have been spent enforcing it? Oh, I, I personally wouldn't know that. I do, I do know of uh, one person who he didn't have the QR code for his business and then you know, came back the next week and it was now there. Um, mm. He was not someone who was particularly keen about the whole thing. Mm. I mean, it's as I said, it's a question that has to be weighed up. It, 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 there's the opportunity cost of either in spending police money and resources on this or actually, and what's going to happen with the crime rate when people realise that, you know, um, the police are too busy doing this. I think another factor with that is too, um, from what I've heard, is that the Service New South Wales app and its services are actually um, quite impressive in comparison to other states as well. So I find when I go to the do the, the QR check-in, it's quite easy for me. It just pops up in two seconds. It has all my information. So well, I, I think that's probably able to do that. Yeah, I think that's probably why in New South Wales you're pretty much able to keep it keep the state reasonably open for within reason for so long because you had had all this set up. The contact tracing was well developed. I mean, here in, uh, compared to what it was in Victoria where they were using pen, paper and fax machines and in WA where, you know, one person returns a positive test and two and a half million people get locked in the homes because the Premier's afraid that the contact tracers can't go. You know, I think you're in a different world over there for sure. So again, that's that's an, that's another factor. I did have another question come in. It says, "Do you support constitutional amendment to effectively separate the executive and legislative branches in Australia, as was initially championed by our primary constitutional author Andrew Clark? And what is your position on the entrenchment of state constitutions similar to the United States?" I'll answer the second question first. See, the state constitutions generally have what, what we call plenary power. Basically, the government, can, the state governments do can do whatever it likes, provided it's for the peace, order, and good government of the state. So, if you have entrenched state constitutions again, it gets back to the question of what I was talking about with charters of rights and freedoms. You put something on a piece of paper, it can get challenged in the courts. It becomes justiciable. Is that is that what we really want? And I'm just putting it out there. Um, is that something you really want? Looking at other experiences. Uh, in terms of the, the second question, the sep true separation of the legislative and the judicial branches and the executive, is the person, is there any more detail on that in terms, because the branches are, at law are, are separate anyway, but is that more like a US system where the judges and get voted in 
Is is that what the person is that what the question is proposing? I'm not sure exactly. That's that's all the information they've kind of provided. Okay. One thing I will say is that look, the issue that we have in our system is that there is an issue with obviously judges getting appointed by the government of the day. And when you have a government in power for a long time, or a particular party in power for a long time, I mean, you only need to look at what's happened in Victoria. What is it? The Liberals have been in government there for what, four out of the last 20 years, right? And you look at you know, the, the Cardinal Pell case. You know, you had two judges, two justices of appeal who didn't have criminal law as part of their as part of their areas, areas of expertise, um, reverse the onus of proof. And the only uh, criminal judge on the court, obviously, gave a brilliant exposition of the onus of proof. Um, so if there's, a, if there's an argument that, yeah, there may be these, we need to, again, look a little bit more at the separation of powers to stop that kind of thing happening, then, yeah, maybe that's something that could be considered because then it took that to go all the way to the High Court and the High Court to remind us 7-0 um, of innocent, unproven guilty. Goes to the follow-up, uh, should he who makes the law be the one implementing the law? Goes to uh, Madisonian theory of government. Maybe he who implements the law should also make sure there should be safeguards to ensure that he is also subject to the law. So, and I think that's what we've seen um, at the moment. You know, obviously, certain people uh, have a bit more equal than others. Yeah, so there's... there's and all, all these questions, yeah... Uh, are very good and theoretical and definitely um, have probably only come up because now we're looking at the frailties of our, our federal system of government, um, which definitely, um, looking at it now, of, of what's happened over the last 18 months, definitely you could you could make an argument that all these, uh, that constitutional reform definitely needs to be looked at. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with that is, of course, is that to get an amendment up, what do you need, Andrew, to get an amendment up? You majority need. of major, a constitutional amendment, majority of voters in a majority of states. Yeah. So the bar set really high. Um, so a case would, and it's only happened twice. Any constitutional referenda, um, it's happened twice. One was, of course, the Aboriginal referendum in '67. The other one was sex, to amend to insert the civil prescription, section 5223A. They're the only two amendments that have got up. In our federal history, so it's there's def, as I said, there's definitely an argument for making these, but it has to be a pretty good argument to convince to convince people that the the constitution should be amended for sure. So the, so the current frailties of the system are because they haven't necessarily been challenged in the past, and so because of that, we're mm. we're you know, you know we're we're in uncharted waters. Yeah, and, abs and, and and instead of waiting for some sort of conclusion. Um, uh, to it, governments are just going ahead with their threats anyway. That's right. That's right, because they've got the state of emergency and we can do whatever we like. And again, relying on the compliance of the people. And in Australia, because I think you know, we've been governed so well over so long, there's also the, you know, there's that she'll be right made attitude, I think, as part of the national psyche. There's the complacency that's, that's set in. And yeah, the fact that We've lived a very charmed existence. I mean, it's not the lucky country for nothing. Up until now, up until relatively recently, bo both political parties never really wanted to rock the boat as far as that was concerned. I mean, Bob Hawke tried in the 1980s with an ID card and that brought people out into the streets. And that, that's the thing that uh, saddens me a lot, that if that could bring people out in the streets in their tens of thousands 30-odd years ago, and what we're seeing now is far more egregious and people are content to, yeah, please, please tell me what to do. Yeah, do I need to put a mask on? Okay, I'll put on three if you want. Yeah, um, that kind of silliness. Um, that's the saddest thing about it. But we also had uh, parties like Sir Robert Menzies, the Liberal Party you know, was founded on principles of, of true freedom and Sir Robert Menzies, you can look at any of his, any of his speeches and he enunciates all those principles so, so clearly. Uh, and so eloquently, and up until now, Liberal leaders have believed in all of those, and there hasn't really been a need for us to stand up against uh, tyrannical measures because we haven't needed to. And uh, compare what's happened now with back with previous epidemics, you know, swine flu and things like that, when f you know fear mongering, modelling, you know, that tens of thousands of people are going to die. I mean, 
the, the politicians at the time um, told the modelers to get stuff. Basically, they said, this is fear mongering. We're not going to listen to it. So what's, what's been the big change now? People can speculate as to, as to why. As a follow up to that, but a, a bit of a pivot. What are your thoughts on an independent commission against corruption federally? Again, you only need to look at um, what's happened in New South Wales with the Independent Commission in, Against Corruption. I mean, whatever you think of Gladys Berejiklian's relationship with Darren Maguire, again, she was hauled before that um, when there were no charges against her. I mean, they, these they have to. If we're going to have one, they have to respect the rule of law. Innocent and proven guilty. You cannot have inquisitions until charges have been laid. And all these kind of they cannot be allowed to turn into potential show trials, which is which is what's been happening. Um, as there's a similar commission against corruption in Western Australia, and um, because the rules, and I mean I'm broadly paraphrasing here. Um, again, you know, it's the rule the rule of law as we understand it in terms of innocent, unproven, guilty rules of evidence and that kind of thing. Um, basically, they get a they can tap your phone. You're in the dock. In the witness box and then oh by the way we heard you say this on the phone the, the witness hasn't got an opportunity to to respond to that where are the principles of natural justice so it's all well and good to argue for these kind of things but as i'd have to say well look the rule of law natural justice procedural fairness all those things have to be inbuilt before an independent commission against corruption is even considered as much as we need one by the way as much as we need something to monitor um, this kind of thing Again, you have to ensure that it doesn't turn into a witch trial or a witch hunt or a or a show trial, which is what's happened in other commissions against corruption in other states. Got another question um, from the audience: Were vaccine passports ever implemented in past pandemics, like the Spanish flu or the Hong Kong flu? And if so, would it still be effective? Okay, um, not uh, not the Spanish flu, as far as I'm aware, and definitely not the Hong Kong flu. Um, which, by the way, per head of pop, if you were to extrapolate it for population growth, claimed nearly as many as American lives as this as does as has done coronavirus. But again, no lockdowns, no nothing. I'll just make that point. But there was a mandate issued back in the 19th century in relation to the smallpox vaccine. Whole villages, towns, protested against it and stood up against it and eventually won. And the principle of um, informed consent, shall we say, uh, some may call it conscientious objection, uh, was actually recognised when uh, the governments realised, well, look, we actually can't mandate this. We can't mandate. So it has been tried before, um, was unsuccessful eventually. That leads me into something I think we were talking a little bit earlier and I've been talking about with a few people that, again, I'll use the, I'll use the, French example. At the moment, people who are who haven't had the jab or don't want to have the the PCR test or rapid antigen test, whatever test they're using in France, are sitting outside restaurants and picnicking while the restaurants are empty. Civil disobedience, but without breaking the law, if you get what I mean. And in the state of Oregon, a similar thing happened when they wanted to implement QR codes or contact registers. And Oregon is a blue state. I mean, they're Democrat. They're, 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 that rusted on for, for the Democratic Party. But when the mayor of Portland wanted to impose a mandate, a contact a QR code contact tracing mandate, the people of Portland said no. And after a month, she had to relent. So the solution to these kind of things is as much up to us as to try and change the system. I mean, the solution is what I'm trying to is trying to say is also political. You look at parties like the Liberal Democrats, okay? Some of those parties on to the right, Palmer, One Nation, you name it. That's where I think the solution partly lies. If we don't like these laws, well, it's up to us to put someone in to try and change it. Don't forget, what's that saying about we get the government we deserve? I'm sure there are people in Victoria that are regretting it now. In Western Australia, there are people, I mean, it's not as it's not obviously as much, but there are people who are definitely regretting uh, giving the McGowan government unparalleled power in both houses now because 
He's got carte blanche to do whatever he wants. And people are seeing just what that leads to. That's something we have to think about. I mean, when these vaccine passports in, introduced in New South Wales, what are people going to do? Are they going to do what the French are doing and picnic outside empty restaurants? Are you just going to go in and comply? And I'm not, obviously I'm not advocating law breaking, but I don't think in saying that I am. I'm just trying to provoke your audience to think about what can, what are the possible solutions here? Because we've got court cases going on that may not be determined for a while and if they are, may not be determined the way we want them to go for whatever reasons. Um, so you have to look elsewhere for the solutions. And people have raised solutions about amending the constitution, but immediately that's not going to happen. So what are the immediate things people can do? We've got a, yeah, you've got a, we've got a federal election coming up soon. We've got parties out there who are anti-lockdown, anti-vaccine passport, um, restoration of rights, fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, and then again, it's also up to us um, to say, well, look, within reason, I'm not going to comply with these things. As much, I, uh, what did Tony Abbott say yesterday? I mean, it, the, this public health tyranny, the sooner it ends, the better. Well, it's up to us to try and do that. Uh, he, I think he was, he was well, he said what he said, he was well within his rights to do what he did, but he's not going to contest the fine because he hasn't got, he hasn't got the time, hasn't got time or energy to waste. Well, again, yeah, that's also what people are relying on, uh, that we don't have time and energy or that, to waste on these things. Well, maybe we, maybe we should be thinking about that. It was the police resources he didn't want to waste. Yeah, exactly. So this, this, these are some of the things we have to think about. Yeah, these, and like, that, like those courageous um, people that are now being fronting up for these, these class actions, maybe we, maybe we can help them in some way by thinking about these things that I've, think these, think these thoughts that I've mentioned about how we act politically, because at the end of the day, we're all political beings. So I am aware of the time. We do only have about four minutes left, but we did just have two more audience questions if you have sure. time. Sure. One of them actually sure. touched on what you already mentioned. It says, are you concerned that Western Australia Labor's near full control over the Western Australian Parliament will permit any healthy discussion of COVID regulations? Oh, it already has, um, because um, you only need to look at the last state election where the difference, but you couldn't tell the difference between what the Liberal Party was proposing uh, under its opposition leader, where he said he stood what did he, uh, lockstep in line with the public health advice and what the Premier was proposing. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, but the other thing, too, is people now, again, have become so scared and the Premier, again, has played on this secessionist nonsense that you hear over here all the time. Good politically, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's, defini it's definitely dangerous. Sooner or later, push is going to have to come to shove, I think, because... People, if come, what is it, Easter next year, they can't go and see family, it will have been two years. It's definitely what giving him unparalleled control is dangerous for a lot of reasons. Eventually, eventually people, are, when they see, what is it, Stephen Marshall said today, he's going to open up once it hits, what is it, 80%, he's going to open up no matter what, he's going to follow the national plan. If premiers start doing that, you're going to have a couple of hermit kingdoms and I think eventually... People are not going to like it. Maybe not now, but eventually. All right. Well, and, well, another question that's come in. Sorry, just my my pictures um cutting in. That's and out. all right. Um, with WA and Queensland having the lowest vaccination rates in the country, it seems that has more to do with the premier pushing as COVID zero policy mm. and having little uh, to no cases at all. Is that mm. more to do with supply and demand rather than actual legislation? Possibly, um, but it's also to do with the COVID safe mentality. Yeah, we're all right here. It's not here, so. Why do we need to rush out and get it? What is it you saw that, what is it with these Delta outbreaks in New South Wales and Victoria, how the, the vaccination rates have spiked? But having said that, this issue of supply and demand, it, it could be, um, but if that, that could be a political smokescreen. Daniel Andrews tried to use that the other day to score some political points, but it's it's very much the, the fact that, it, that there's a COVID safe mentality in both those, a COVID zero, I should say, mentality. Um, which, of course, is unsustainable. I mean, in West Australia, what? We, we get our money from two things, pulling stuff out of the ground and tourism. Now, pulling stuff out of the ground is doing okay because we've got a market in China. But once the iron ore price falls, the state's in trouble. 
um, because at the moment we're not getting any tourists and the tourism industry uh, employs far more far more people than many care to realize particularly not so much in Perth but in the regions um, because you've got Shark Bay and Broome and the Kimberley and then down south you've got the the, the wine regions and and all of that plus the, the coastline um, so yeah eventually as I say eventually it's not going to be sustainable for those reasons and yeah, Queensland, I don't need to tell you about tourism in Queensland. I was just going to say, my, my final question was, uh, I feel a lot of people in Australia have been quite surprised, I suppose, as the us first them when it comes to the different states. I think a lot of people felt that Australia was quite different to America, that we didn't have that kind of conflict between the states. A question that's been sent in to me here says, do you think the Western Australian Premier in particular has created this us first end because I think this question has come in because you touched on that kind of Western Australia uh, mm. secession. And I speak from personal experience here, having been the head of a national association, doing it from Perth, it's not easy because we live in the most isolated city in the world. So when you're isolated, there is that very insular mentality. There are numerous examples in history of that. So that's already there. And then the fact that we are so far away. It gives us a bit of a chip on the shoulder over here because, for example, yeah, you know, when I was trying to organise things with the time difference, it's like we'll do it at nine o'clock. Uh, but you do realise that's six o'clock over here during summertime. Now, I, I, su- I support daylight saving and all that, so you know you don't need to. I'm not going to go. You know, I voted. I've always voted for daylight saving because it's just common sense. But you know, um, but the fact of the matter is that, yeah, I mean, people in the East do tend to forget that there is a state over here. Um, yeah, that, and, and it's just those little things that, yeah, like we'll set up a meeting at 9 o'clock, but you do realise that, yeah, in winter at 7 and, oh, oh yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, right, okay. Th- 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 those, those kind of things. There was also um, an argument that was made about the carve-up of the GST revenue, particularly in Western Australia, was doing very well during the mining boom where what well, we weren't even getting back 50 cents in the dollar. Having said that, people forget um, that Western Australia for many years was actually subsidised by the eastern states. But, of course, up in, well, I think up until the 1950s because West Austra- the West Australian mining real industry took off in the late 50s and early 60s and through the 70s. Um, so before that time, when mining royalties uh, really started kicking in, West Australia is actually quite heavily subsidised um, by the East. Um, and one thing that uh, point that Paul Murray made uh, the other night, uh, because the West Australian budget came down on Thursday, if you look deep into the budget papers, you have to go to budget paper number three, page 59 or something, to look at the main sources of income or revenue for the state budget. Number one is... Mining. Number two is GST revenue. And that, so both of those are around $10 billion. The biggest one at $13 billion is government grants. Commonwealth government grants. Biggest con- <laughs> contributor to revenue in the WA budget. Now, these, of course, are things that are swept under the carpet and are not spoken about. Um, yeah, so it's easy for a tin pot state premier to make these kind of populist secessionist arguments based on isolationist mentality and chip on the shoulder, some of which is for good reason, some of which is not, when the reality reflects otherwise. And as I say to people who crap on about, I know there's a family show, so sorry, so crap on about secession. I say, okay, well, well, what we'll do now is you can will increase your stamp duty and your payroll tax. Why? Because oh, you, know, you realise if we secede, we need an army. Why? Because we're well, our own country now. We have to have an army, a navy you know, to defend us. So that means that all else, you'll be paying, you'll be paying more for everything. You'll be, oh, I don't really, I didn't really look at it like that. So there is, yeah. So it's easy, it's easy for a state premier to, to, to play on those things, particularly over here. Um, when between this when between this city and the next a thousand kilometers is the desert and nothing else. Well, I'm I'm glad you told us that um that we're not going to be uh, separating anytime soon. Well, hopefully not anyway. 
um because there's you know definite vested interests in uh, uh for western australia to stay um within the federation yeah. but um we do have to wrap up now okay Dr. thank you so much for coming on this has been pleasure great. all right i hope, um, hope what i've been able to say has been insightful and um i've probably asked more questions than answered but this issue is going to be evolving. These issues are going to be evolving and changing as we've seen. They've changed from hour to hour, let alone day to day. So, well, thanks, thanks for um, for giving me your time to, to come talk to Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Pleasure. All right. Thank All you right. for having me. Thank you. My, I am Andrew Kremen, and this is Rory O'Connor. Thank you for tuning in to the Sunday Sessions podcast. We'll see you next week.